Hi, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the SME Club by Pro Manchester, very proudly sponsored by us at Virgin Money. And usually I'd be do we're running these events in our Market Street store in Manchester, but as we all continue to work from home, it's great that we can still connect with you all through these events online. And through the COVID crisis, our priority has been making sure that the support is there for our customers and any support that we offer, all of it can be found on our website. And we'll make sure that that's circulated to you following this event so you can access that. And we'd love to know what you think about today's event. So do tag us in any of your social posts. We are at Virgin Money on all social media platforms. And today's topic is inclusive recruitment. So I will hand over to Omar and Kelly to kick it off. Thank you very much, Ruby. Thank you to Virgin Money and Pro Manchester, obviously, for making this space available to us. Um, Omar and myself are trying to work together in the office, uh, slowly getting back into, into normality. So we'll see how it works with us being together. Um, anyway, good morning. Of course, my name is Kelly. I'm the founder at Honor. Uh, I work mostly to deliver diversity and inclusion training and support for companies. And I do a lot of work as well around intercultural communications to enhance communication within multicultural, multilingual teams and with clients around the world. I'm Omar Javid. I'm the founder of Occult Jobs, a technology platform for recruiters and recruitment managers to diversify their workforce. I'm also an associate trainer with Ono Training, and I'm here to help Kelly deliver today's seminar. Thank you very much. Um, so, of course, today we're looking at inclusive recruitment, but we're going to be focusing on looking really at inclusive job, job descriptions and interviews. Um, there's, there's not time for us to do everything, but of course, we'll look into these areas in a bit more detail and give you some, some ideas on how to look into that. Um, please do make a note of our emails. If you want to contact us at any time, please do that. Add us on LinkedIn. Today's really starting a conversation, sharing this information with you. But if anybody wants to get in touch, we're very happy to do a free 30 minute consultation to look at this in more detail in relation to your company after today's session. Okay. So what we will be covering uh, very briefly in the, in the short time that we have is looking at what you can see on the screen there. So job descriptions, shortlisting, and a few comments about interviews and job offers. Um, so the first thing I'm going to start to look at, of course, then is the job descriptions. So within the recruitment process, of course, job descriptions are just one small part of this. You no, know? um, all of the different areas that we have are the preparation for recruitment, advertising your vacancy, selecting the candidates, at which point you might need support with your unconscious bias. So that's another area to look at. And then the interview process, uh, making a job offer. And of course, finally, the onboarding. So as, as you can see, and I'm sure you're all aware of that recruitment process has many stages to that. What we're going to be looking at really is, is the job descriptions that will help you, of course, prepare for that interview process itself. And then we'll look at a few pointers to really think about when you are doing the interview process to make sure both parts of that are really as inclusive as they can be. Okay, so, so I jump in. So we're gonna go through a high level overview of what is a job description and what is its purpose. Um, just a few things about the job description itself. It has to be clearly defined. Um, one third of employees tend to leave a role after the first three months. Half of them leave because of club. They, they claim that the role wasn't clearly defined. So it's really important at the outset to have the role perfectly outlined um, in the job description. The second point is around attracting candidates. It is your sales pitch. You're going to go out to the market. You want to bring the best candidates in. And you also want to attract candidates from different groups. So the wording is very important. In relation to the hierarchy, you want to know who is responsible for what elements of the role. It also um, removes the um, element of gender pay gap um, by having it claimed as bank. Performance management and basis for compensation. Again, going back into as a structure, it's important to have the job description internalized as well as externalized. 
Now, of course, when we're doing all of this, it's just important to remember why we're talking about this as an inclusive element and why this diversity is important to, to companies when they're looking at their job descriptions and recruitment. And of course, we all know the business benefits to having a more diverse workforce, but it's just remembering those at this stage of the process as well, because they very often get forgotten. You know? So diversity champions inclusion of people from different backgrounds and groups. We need to make sure that as we're recruiting, we are selecting people from different backgrounds and groups, and we're not creating uh, a homogenous workforce uh, in that recruitment process. So it's, it's really important to remember this as well. You know? Remember, of course, they will be more productive and profitable if we have a team that's diverse, so all of the people within that team will, will perform better, which of course for you as a company is, is a benefit. Candidates looking to, to work with a new company, of course, as well, will be looking at what that company is like. So who are the people within that company? Is that workforce diverse? And are they going to feel part of that? And are they welcome as well? So it's really quite important to have a policy and also show a face uh, of, of kind of being represented with different diversities when you're looking for people. And of course, it builds reputation. You know, it's, it's good as a company to have that good positive reputation. You attract the best candidates if you're doing that. Now, as part of this, when you are thinking about who it is that you want to be recruiting, you really, really need to think before you do anything, who is your ideal candidate? You need to be considering who you want to be recruiting. Now, when you're thinking about your ideal candidate, the first thing, of course, is taking a step back and looking at, at the team that you currently have and then starting to think what elements you need from this new candidate. So we've put here just a few, few pointers to remind you of, of key ideas. So thinking about this idea of experience. You know, very often we jump to say, well, we'd like somebody with five years experience, 10 years experience. Really think about this before you're, you're requesting it as a, a requirement from, from these new candidates. Do they need that experience? Can you open up your recruitment process to people with less experience, but maybe more energy or new, um, new information if they've just recently completed a master's program, for example? We very often include words like dynamic, engaging. Um, again, think when you're using these words in your, in your job descriptions, do you really need those words? Do you really need those elements? Or do you need somebody who will work well within the team and give you results? So thinking really carefully about what it is that you're asking for in the qualities of the candidate. And that last point in there as well, the technical skills. So really, really think, do you need to be specifying that the candidate has a particular level of technical skill? Or is this something that actually within your current team you could support them with once they were part of that? So it's really thinking before you jump to conclusions about what it is that you're requiring, whether or not some of these things are more flexible, because by opening those up, you can attract a more diverse range of, of candidates for that role. And you're not limiting that role to certain people who already have that experience or those, those skills from, the, from previous experiences in the past. OK, um, just running through the format of a job description. We're going to go through the title, summary, roles and responsibilities, skills, knowledge and qualifications working conditions and salary. This should be a standard format that we go through. We're going to go through each item in more detail now. Um, we're going to go through it in detail based on the data around maximizing the amount of candidates applying for it, but also adding the diverse element to it as well. So let's start with the title. What we see is a marked drop off of applications when you go over 80 characters. So it's important that you keep the title under 80 characters um, avoid internal acronyms. You want to be as inclusive as possible. You want people from different backgrounds who have maybe come through a different educational route to apply for the role. They might call the role um, something slightly different. So just avoid the internal acronyms on that point. Moving on to the summary. The summary shouldn't be more than 250 characters long. It has to be a snapshot of a strong and compelling argument of why your company is a place to work. It should be a high level overview of the role. You want to use inclusive language as well. Use a lot of we's, us, used, very, very conversational rather than just informational. Moving on to the roles and responsibilities, 47 points, keep it keep it within these parameters. Again, you see a marked drop off of applications. People tend to drop off after after seven points and under four is not going to give enough information about the role. Only describe the essential functions of the role and this is very much informational. Anything that you need the candidate to know at the outset, put it in here. 
this is something that's going to continue with the role. Obviously, if you're going to develop the role, that's fine. But this is this is a point where we fall down to the initial point that I made around candidates dropping off at 30% um, after th sorry 30% of candidates dropping off after three months. It's down to this point. So make sure that everything that you need in the role is described in it. Moving on to the next point, skills, knowledge and qualifications. There's a huge disparity in this area. Women in this area will apply to only, only apply to roles that they meet all 100% of the criteria uh, at 60% of the criteria, whereas, whereas men, go, sorry, I've got that computer. <laughs> Thank men go for this, will apply to a role if they meet 60% of the criteria in this area, whereas women will target 100%. So it's important to know that anything in this, make sure that you, going back to Kelly's point earlier, is it something that you really, really need? Um, you know, we, we saw the example earlier in the week around, um, in Scotland around the A-level results, where mm -hmm. there was an 8% difference in the downgrading of the um, qualifications to people from poorer areas, to people from richer areas. So it's really important that you get this clarified. Make it a list and keep it to around five points max. You don't really want to exceed that as well. Uh, working conditions obviously very relevant at the moment with around COVID, you know, what, what are your COVID measures out there? Also pre-COVID and post-COVID, hopefully when we get through this, you want to outline any flexible working conditions. We do expect to see an uptake in people offering what flexible working, make sure this is outlined. You want to bring in people who are from different communities, different groups, all of them will have different requirements. If you do have physical requirements for a role, this is where you put it in. If people are going to need to, for example, climb ladders, make sure it's defined here. So people who who have the ability to apply for a role, make that, that will encourage them to apply for it. But then it, um, this is a point that you want to discourage people who are not able to apply for the role due to physical requirements. And then going on to the final point of salary, um, you see a 60% increase in applications when, when you load the salary. It's also important for the banding as well with the gender pay gap rules coming into play. And then um, in the future, we expect uh, a racial pay gap um, reporting as well. Make sure your salary is banded and it's very public of what the candidate expects. Um, yeah, sorry, it's silly. Um, moving on to where to source your candidates. Are you, you need to advertise it in multiple sources. Um, are you advertising it internally? It's really important to be inclusive and involve as many as you work as possible. When you're externally advertising, where are you externally advertising it? People in different communities search for jobs in different ways. So in, in recruitment, for example, it's huge for recruiters to advertise through LinkedIn. You know, that, that's one of the larger platforms. But then a lot, a lot of communities don't engage with LinkedIn. You know, we, we see people going out and the, the most inclusive employees have a wide range of um, advertising, external advertising techniques that can be out in the community with local community groups all the way through to LinkedIn and they're just headhunting. Recruitment agents, what are they doing? Are they are they just following the process that you are you following yourself or are they doing it? Are they going out and advertising? externally through a diverse um, diverse range. Are they accredited? Um, the, um, they, do they have an accreditation that they're going to be applying through various different um, diverse means? And then also what's legal? You know, we, you, we, we need to be very, very careful in the language that's used. Um, you know, it's obviously it's illegal to recruit for all women shortlists or men shortlists. What you want to do is rather than breaking the legalities, just be as inclusive as possible when you're when you're recruiting. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm just aware, of course, that we're, we're trying to get to yeah, so just, much in such a yeah, short period. No, yeah. don't worry. Such a short period of time. Of course, this is being recorded, so you'll be able to look through things. But we're, we're very conscious that we want to give you time at the end for questions and answers. So we're going to go through as, as much as we can, and then we'll, we'll look back if there's anything that we want to look at in more detail you'd like to ask us. So really touching on all of those points that Omar has just explained, there are so many different elements that go into creating, of course, your job description, making sure that it is fair and inclusive and things that we often overlook. So this is an advert that was taken off a job board just a couple of months ago. So it's a real ad 
Now, um, I've used it because actually it's quite a nice example of some things that we should be doing. So you can see, of course, you've got quite a few bullet points. You've got the duties, including here only three. Again, I'm always mentioning it might be good to have four points in there. You know, I myself have been one of those people who's taken a job and a couple of months in realised that it doesn't actually match up to the description and, and had to leave. Um, so thinking about the number of, of points that you're including in that, but also the type of information that you're including in that. So actually, Omar, if you could just skip to the next slide yeah. for me. I've highlighted a couple of points here that I think are quite useful for us to look at. And I'd like you to, to use this almost as an example of things that you can start to consider. So taking into consideration all the things Omar's pointed out, when you are looking at your own job descriptions, maybe to see how you might adapt them in the future, there are things that we can start to think about. So of course, you've got at the top there, quite clearly, this is full-time permanent basis at location. Again, it might be worth mentioning there, we've, we've talked about whether or not it's flexible, whether or not you need to be at that location because of course, by opening that up, you can offer this job or, or attract some more diverse uh, candidate talent pool, which is really, really important. Next, we've got key information, it's a national charity. People will like to know these kinds of details about the company that they're working for. You could include in there as well, more description about the company, give them an idea of, of who you are. Now, on that third line, as assistant manager, you'll be ensuring effective coordination. And again, be really, really careful with these types of words. Effective coordination, well, what is effective? Can you maybe define that a little bit more clearly? Because one person might, um, of course, look at something being effective in a very different way to another person. So just trying to be as clear as possible with what it is that you mean. Okay. Of course, a lot of these things can then be followed up at interview, but to really try to recruit people early on or attract people, you can do that by adapting the language that you're using. Now, main duties will include, of course, I've just mentioned that if we can include four points, that's even better, but we do have three here that are quite well explained. We've got quite a lot of detail here to tell us what's going on. Again, thinking about some of the language that we're using um, to ensure the care is of the highest quality. Again, if you could be a little bit more specific, what is high quality? What does that actually mean to you and your company? What does that care entail? Does it need to be a certain amount of time in a certain place? or any other factors that, that you might consider important. But what they have done here that I think that's really, really lovely, and people do this, but sometimes don't do it very well, is talking about the benefits that they include. So if you can start to include those benefits and details, it will really show that you are a company who's open, who's going to share that information, and it helps people to feel more comfortable. So of course, you've got first, first benefit, of course, the um, salary. And Omar was mentioning before that by showing this, you are showing that you are aware of being clear about these things. And of course, you're aware possibly of those issues with the gender pay gap. Um, you've got your holidays mentioned, you've got discount schemes, excellent training and support. Now, including this is really, really important. But as well, when you're saying this, what kind of support are you attracting? Can you tell them about maybe support groups that you have or networks that you have within your company for maybe certain groups of staff that could attract dip candidates from different backgrounds to apply if they see that there is a support network relating to their community? Um, so again, it's an opportunity really for you to showcase a lot of things and to attract more people. So it's a really good starting point to think about some of these, these really simple elements that we can adapt very easily. We are going to look a little bit later on actually as well at the language which Omar mentioned. There's a couple yeah. of things there that are really useful. Now, of course, looking at gender bias, um, we need to be careful because without us realising most of the language and the words that we are using carry a really strong masculine or feminine quality. So some of the things that we can be doing when we're using the language is checking, first of all, the pronouns. Are we talking about he or she or they? No, so thinking about the types of pronouns that we might be using to make it as inclusive as we can using gender neutral titles as well. So thinking about, of course, people now are very aware of the difference between actor and actress, those kinds of things that we might be able to, to adapt. And of course, this gender charged words, I'll look at in a moment, I'm going to give you one example, but thinking about the language that we use is gender coded. So it does have a gender bias in there and it will attract more masculine or feminine candidates. And there is a way for us to check this before we publish anything, which I'll show you in a moment. But I'm just going to mention that fourth bullet point. So refrain from superlatives. So don't try to use, we want the highest quality, we want the best candidate. By using those adjectives and the superlative adjectives, you're really just broadening the spectrum and you're not saying what it is that you want. Be clearer about things. When you say you want the highest quality, what does that really mean? What do you actually want from that candidate? And again, that ties back into what we mentioned before about really, really considering before you start to do any of this, what it is that you need and what it is that you want within your company. 
Um, okay, so thinking about the gender gender charged words. Now, there are lots of different decoders that you can use online. I'm going to show you one example now from the web link that you can see there, the cat map field gender decoder. You can type in different language or you can copy in your job description and it will tell you about some of the words that you used and what their gender bias might be. So if we look at the next slide, we can see here, this is just one example from an advert, masculine coded words, ambition and competitive, so they might attract masculine candidates, whereas other words might attract feminine candidates. You can see here interpersonal, supportive, together. And if you put your job advert through one of these decoders, it can give you a little bit of information about what you might be inadvertently expressing without realising, and that can, can have a big impact on what it is that you're including or not including uh, in that job description itself as well. But really great thing about these mm. is they do give you alternatives. Yeah, um, yeah, they're really helpful tools. And they're completely free. You know, they're some free. of them you do have to pay for, but there is quite a lot you can do to the cat map field one. There's a lot you can do for yeah. free. There's some really good stuff on there and it's really easy to do. It takes a couple of minutes. Um, again, when you're writing these job descriptions or any text at all, actually, uh, I'd always recommend using one of these writing tools to help you as well. So I've just put a few different things on there that you can use. Textio and Tap Recruit have paid for functions on them if you want to look at the language that you're using. Um, but actually, some of the other things at the bottom, so Hemingway app and Conscious Style Guide are free tools. And the Hemingway app is a really good tool at helping you check how clear the language that you've used is. So it's a really, really easy tool to use. It's a free website, copy and paste the information into that, and it will tell you about how you've written that text and whether or not it's going to be easy for somebody to read. And actually it gives you examples of things that you can change. So there's, a, there's actually a, an example of this if we tap through. Yeah. This is what it looks like if you go onto HemingwayApp.com. Um, it will tell you exactly what it is that you need to change. It will highlight things in different colours and it, that can really help you as well just to make sure that things are as clear as possible. We've got to, of course, include in here linguistic diversity. So you might be attracting candidates who don't have English as a first language or people who haven't studied to a higher level. And again, it's really thinking about making sure that what you're producing isn't excluding any of these different groups. Um, so the most you can do or the most work you can do around this, the better. OK, it's just I don't know who wants you want to do it. Yeah. On. <laughs> I think I think you do this one. Now. OK, yeah. um, so just a few things then to think about. So we've talked a little bit about that language. I almost talked, of course, to you different things about the job descriptions um, and then just thinking more generally about you as a company. Are you an inclusive recruiter? No. So what things can you be including? What things are you doing or not doing that you're aware of or unaware of that you can start to think about to, to become more aware of what it is that might might change or help the situation? So. Can you mention benefits that you have? Are there any inclusive benefits? No. Are you very flexible with certain things? Can you offer benefits um, that other companies don't have? Do you offer the access to gyms that might help people who maybe need to do more exercise? There's a, a range of different things and none of them are a few, none of them are small. So it's always good to include those in there. Second point you've got here, of course, is looking at this work life balance. And again, really important to mention this. If you do offer flexibility or you do offer financial benefits, there might be people who are parents and have um, children that they need to look after who need that flexi time. There might be people with caring responsibilities, again, who would really benefit from that if they had it and might attract them to your company as opposed to a different company. So again, it's just mentioning these things. If you offer them, talk about them. No. In terms of making things more comfortable for people as well, mention if you have a workspace that's comfortable. Do you have a workspace that's suitable for wheelchair users? Do you have a workspace where you can adapt the lighting, for example, that could be an issue for, for maybe neurodiverse talent? And it's really thinking about all of these different things that can make that space more comfortable and more appealing for a wider variety of candidates. You know? By not doing it, you're excluding people. So if you can include that and offer that, talk about it. Now looking at the fourth box, experience, this is something that I mentioned before as well. So when you're thinking about who it is you're trying to attract, think how much experience you actually need that person to have. No, are you excluding people by demanding that they have a certain level of experience or excluding people quite often because they have too much experience? No, so think how can you make this job offer open to maybe old candidates, candidates who are recent graduates, candidates who are very young who haven't studied yet. So how could you make that more flexible for different people? Because everybody has something to bring and it's a case of working out how you might support them being able to do that for your company. In, in that experience, yeah. I'm just going to 
do. Jump, jump in. So with um, especially the older candidates and the younger candidates, yeah. the wording again comes into play. Yeah. So using words like dynamic indicates that you're looking for a younger, younger candidate and you, you are excluding the older candidates. So again, look at the words that you're using, usually tools that you've you, you've outlined, yeah, just and, and very often they're really simple, small things that we can do to, to make these changes, and we just don't realize that by, by changing one little thing, it can have a big impact. So, yeah. a lot of this work is easier than we think. Um, last couple of things, really quickly. So, mentioning, of course, if you do have those employee networks or supportive groups, because again, you'll be showing them to prospective candidates that you are open to supporting people and also that there are people that they can connect with and understand within that company. So, that could really appeal as well. And of course, we mentioned flexi working uh, just before, but when you are talking about flexi working, mention are you talking about time or location or both? Okay, because that's also something that can be really, really important for people. Okay, so before you publish, um, there's just a number of points that you need to you need to go through. Mm -hmm. Have it checked. If one person has created the job description, make sure a second person, potentially from a different group, has a look at it as well. Outline anything that that is uninclusive with regards to the words or the way that it's getting advertising. Is the leadership team happy and on board with it? Incl include them in the conversation. If the leadership are involved in it, they'll make sure that the direction and the budget to go out and make sure that the role is filled with an inclusive, with an inclusive, um, that's it. Yeah, with an inclusive <laughs> candidate it, it is in place. Is it has anything been missed? Again, that will go through the checking process. Is the language correct? Go through, is there any internal jargon there? Are you, have you gone through the gender decoder? Have you, have you included, excluded any words that could indicate an age bias as well? Mm. Be as inclusive as possible, be conversational, use words like you, we and us, just mm. to make a communication and a conversation between the both. And then is there anything that you can do to attract certain types of candidates? Where are you advertising the roles? You can be very specific and targeted with your advertising to ensure that you do do meet your diversity targets. Um, then again, going into the shortlisting, the longer that you advertise a role for, the more diverse the candidate base. For example, people with certain disabilities take twice as long to apply for a role. So make sure that you give a good amount of time to, what you have, to schedule the advertisement out for. Also, are you advertising in the correct places? Are you advertising in places where different diverse groups congregate? You know, are you uh, I, have you gone into the communities? Have you gone into local church groups? Where are you advertising and make sure you're as diverse with other groups as possible, mm -hmm. rather than just going through your normal routes or LinkedIn or job boards or, or, or wherever it is? I think those, yeah, those two things that are really often overlooked, aren't they, as yeah. well? Because again, they're things that are really easy to change. Just give yourself a couple of weeks extra and you'll get a, a broader range of applications. And the things that we can very easily do and quite often we forget to even think about. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, okay, we've just gone through that. We yeah. just had a click through it, but we'll click through that. Um, yeah, so there's a number of risks and challenges that we need to watch, watch out for. Obviously, one person, if there's one person advertising the role, it is about having that second check. If you're a small organisation or a small company and there is only one person, have someone else check, someone who's close enough to the organisation, who understands what you're looking for, and get them to run through the role. Lack of diverse applications, that's going to happen potentially. You know, if you are advertising for a role where a certain type of group is just able to advertise, uh, applies for it, you're going to have that lack of diversity mm -hmm. through the applications. And then it's up to you to make the changes to the web, the location you're advertising it and the way you're advertising it to ensure that you've got that diversity in applications. Mm -hmm. It's also important to monitor the diversity of applications as well. Yeah, if you're not getting them, that's a really big sign that yeah. something needs to change before that. If you get to the, the uh, interview process and you've got three yeah. candidates who are very much the same, there's obviously been an issue issue with, with the job description yeah. and the, the application process. And then that goes into monitoring as well. Make sure that you're monitoring what type of applications are, how many women you're getting, or how many how many from different groups you're getting from, and it allows you to target the areas where you need to target. Yeah. Tokenism, um, we, we, we see a lot of this, and we are expecting a lot of it. Um, there is a moral and legal um, issues around it. Mm -hmm. um, so make sure that you're not having someone just for the sake of that their race, gender, or wherever it is, make sure that you are actually having the best person for the role because there, there are a number of issues which happen on the back of it. Um, badly reflecting the role um, in the company, obviously that, that's making sure that with regards to your job description, make sure it's clear and conversational and as open as possible. 
And then you also need to support people at the interview stage, and I think Kelly's going to go talk about this a bit further. So, of course, when you are doing that interview, there are a certain number of things we need to consider as well to make sure that the interview process um, is as inclusive as it can be or as supportive as it can be. So once you've done all of the job description and then shortlisting, you get to this interview stage and there's a, there's a few other things we need to consider. So really think about a few issues before you set the date. So when you're scheduling the interview, think about the date and the time. Check the date that you're selecting by using an interfaith calendar. Make sure that you're not setting the interview date on a day that might be an important holiday for certain religious groups, because of course, automatically, then you're excluding those people from coming to that interview. Um, think about the time as well. So people maybe who have caring responsibilities or children, again, might not be able to make first thing in the morning or towards the end of the day. So really consider these factors when you're scheduling that interview, because by scheduling them at a different time, you're automatically opening the door to including more people. Think of course about the location, accessibility issues. It's important to mention the location when you're trying to schedule this interview and give people the opportunity to talk to you about any accessibility issues that they might have. We need to make sure that again, we're not excluding people by putting it in a third floor on a building with no lift. No, so you would really got to be careful with these things. And then of course, preparation. Now, it's really important to tell people exactly what they're going to need to do at this interview particularly neurodiverse candidates might want more time to prepare. They might feel more comfortable if they've been able to think about what is going to happen on the day, how things are going to work, what information they need to think about. And by giving people, anyone really, but by giving people that opportunity to really think about how things are going to work, you're allowing them to prepare and be the best that they can on the day. Um, you don't want to surprise people. Some of us might deal very well with surprises and doing things last, things last minute, other people might not. But really, if you're giving time to prepare, it will help everyone. I'm um, just going on the location mm -hmm. point as well. Yeah. Uh, um, obviously, at the moment, with, with the current environment that we're in, we're, we're all offering very flexible working conditions yeah. and, and interviews. Um, you know, virtual interviews are happening at pretty much 100% rate at the moment. The main thing is, it's a good time now to build your processes and see the benefits of being able to have the virtual interviews. So you can be post-COVID offering that flexibility, especially in our location. Yeah, and again, if, if you are doing things in a physical location and you've decided that that's best for your company, could you maybe, if somebody asked yeah. to do it um, virtually, still accommodate that? You know, don't automatically shut doors to things that, that you don't want to do when they are viable options, yeah. because quite often we do that. Um, okay, so the interview itself. Think about the room, okay, think about the setup. If you are having a, a physical uh, interview in one, in one location, so for example, in your office, of course, now there are restrictions with COVID, but when you're doing that interview, there are small things that you can do to make that candidate feel a lot more comfortable. So by seating the candidate with a position where he can see the door will make him feel a lot more, him or her, this is me, so these are my biases playing up, you, that candidate will have um, a bigger feeling of security and safety, and they'll feel a little bit more in control, and that will, of course, have an impact on how well they present in the interview. So little things that you can do, the room can again have a really positive impact on the candidate's performance. When you're doing that, when you're in the room, think about how everybody's seated as well, because this will play into the panel that you have. No, it's all right. Oh, they all, sorry, don't worry, they all yeah, work sorry. together. Um, so when you're in the room and you've got the panel in there, you want to make sure that people are seated in a comfortable position. You don't want to have three people sitting opposite the candidate and making them feel uncomfortable. So if you can, maybe a circular format would really help. Um, just to break break some of that, that ice really make people feel a little comfortable in there. But when you're organising that panel, think really, how many people do you actually need in that room? No, how many people do you need there? And are those people representative of the company? So think about the number of people that you're having in there. Are those people representative of the company or are they all from one particular department? And think about the seniority of the people in there as well. Is it important there are people from different levels or not? Is it, are, is it more important maybe for this interview process that there are people who will be working alongside the candidate should they be successful? So really thinking about those things and, and deciding carefully who's in there. But while you're deciding who's in that room and who is on the panel, in that room physically or virtually, depending, um, and who's on that panel, think about how much information those panel members actually need. So sometimes it can be very helpful to have some people on the panel who know quite a lot about the candidate before they arrive and people who are seeing the candidate with no previous knowledge as well, so that they're only assessing that candidate on their performance on the day, because having those two perspectives can give us a fairer outcome or a fairer balance. Okay. Now, when you're assessing them, of course, you need to make sure that the processes that you're using are fair. So by doing or using a fixed system of questions, you can really help to eliminate um, any 
unfair questions that you might have for one candidate that you might forget to ask a different person. But by making it more fixed, you can really, really be more inclusive because you're making it the same for everyone. So have fixed questions, have fair questions and keep them on topic. No. So are you asking questions that are related to the skills that are directly mentioned in the job description? Or are you including questions which might, which might throw the candidate and are not included, things that haven't been mentioned before, things they haven't prepared for? So just be really careful to review those questions and think if they're necessary or not. And again, this is something everyone and I talk about quite a lot. Think really carefully about the types of personal questions that you're asking. Are they necessary? But also how you word those questions. You know? So think carefully before saying to somebody, where are you from? You might be making chit chat or making you know, small talk before you start the interview and trying to make somebody feel comfortable, but actually it can have a really negative, worst, negative uh, impact. It is the worst question. I, I, I don't know how to answer that. Um, well, you know, it's, and it, it happens. Especially when you work in the city outside of your own, I work in yeah. London. Yeah. Where are you from? Well, from? they can be very loaded yeah. questions. And again, they're, they're normally completely harmless and people are just trying to make people feel comfortable. But we've got to be careful about how we ask these questions yeah. if they're necessary. No. Um, OK, and then of course, with that interview itself, think about the format of the interview. So does it need to be overly formal or not? No, what it what reflects more, your company better, a more formal interview, a more relaxed interview, people wearing suits or people wearing their jeans. What is going to be more reflective of your company? Think if it's necessary. And of course, as well, mention that in the information you give the candidate before the interview day. Um, think as well about the technicality. So how many questions do you really need to be asking in terms of assessing whether or not candidates can use, for example, a particular software that might be important for the role? Um, what particular skills they have. Think really carefully about those questions and that will connect back to what we were talking about at the beginning when you're writing that job description. What things are actually necessary? What do you need this candidate to do? How technical do you need his knowledge or her knowledge to be? Think carefully about that because you might be excluding them by asking them things that actually at the end of the day won't be that important or things that you could support them with once they're in the role. And again, length, how long is too long? No, um, so so all of these things need to be considered in advance and you should really be um, informing the candidate before they get there about these different points. OK, uh, now on agreeing the evaluation. So before you um, go in to the interview, have a set evaluation set out between all the different people evaluating it. Have it as defined scores and marking, have an assessment criteria against the job description and it's not be, that will allow you not to be influenced by a best fit. Uh, I think that's the most difficult part because that's where your own internal biases come into play. And, and they do come into play, they will come into play if you don't have a, a fixed evaluation sheet. Yeah, and, 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 and it needs to be discussed with all the people who are, doing, who are conducting the interviews beforehand. Um, this is an example form um, that kind of gets locked up. Yeah, there's, yeah. Well, there's, there's yeah. loads of different styles. Yeah. It's just looking at one that works for you as a company. Yeah, right? definitely. Um, so obviously, you know, going through it, you've got the kind of name position. So that, that that's just sort of generic information. Mm -hmm. But um, obviously, they're all going to be quite um, subjective to whoever the interviewer is. Yeah. But at least you've got a criteria of what each person is looking at. Mm -hmm. Something like the strength of the candidate, educational background, obviously that's going to be dependent on what, what the person who's reviewing it sees. Um, their work experience, communication, job specific and match to the company values. Again, these are all things that you can define before you go in to allow you to give the candidate the best job. Um, yeah, no, I was just saying, of course, you've got here that, that idea of excellent, average, good. You, know, you evaluate them in a different way, but make sure the system works. I and mean, on this second example here, you've got numbers. It, it doesn't matter as long as you've got a fixed system that you're going to be applying for everybody in the same way. Yeah, definitely. Um, again, this is just a bit more about the uh, format that we, we set out. Um, just going to go go on to the ne next slide because we've gone through that information a bit <laughs> considered about time. So in the post um, interview, once you've conducted the interview, um, go in, arrange a meeting and have a, have a review of the items. And the most important thing is obviously everyone should be given the room to speak. The mark should also be defined before you go into that room. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you conduct the review, make sure you order it in order of seniority bottom up rather than top down, because what happens in most organisations is the CEO or the director, who were the most senior person in the room, room is, they make a decision that everyone tends to follow suit. So if you do order it, order it in form of seniority, bottom up rather than top down. Yeah. And then when you're looking at the drop off the considerations and remuneration, obviously that's a key thing that I mentioned earlier, you know, is that fixed or is it banded? 
and then is it fairly banded against other people in, in that um, area? I think as long as you're, you've got that structure in place within your organisation of where it fits, make sure it's um, in line with that. The benefits as well, you've advertised the benefits before, is there any additional benefits that your organisation could offer the candidate in order to make their lives easier, in order to bring them in? Um, it may be something that you can advertise, but it may be something that you're working on trying to push that through. Working conditions, are you able to make reasonable adjustments for the candidates? You know, if, if there are someone who, you know, potentially requires a wheelchair, can you, can you cater for them in the space? You know, it's, and it's also being fair with it as well. You know, you don't, it, you don't need to be unreasonable with it. You know, you can be fair with it. Uh, places of work, you know, obviously very relevant at the moment. Are you going to be able to work at home? Are you, do you need people to work from different locations, different offices? Can you be flexible with that? Make sure all of them are involved in the job offer. So the candidate who you want to offer the role for has the best, um, the most information available to them. They've already shown an interest in your organisation because they've had a plan for the role and they've walked through the door for the interview as well. So you're already in a, bit, in a great place to make the offer, but you just want to get them in and make sure they last longer than three months, which is where you start to see the normal drop off. And then when it comes to the successful applicant, obviously you've got negotiations with the around salary and uh, make sure that you've got that banded down, you, you're fair to them, the reasonable adjustments. Then you move to a start date, start date you define your conditions and then that's when the onboarding process starts. The onboarding process in most organisations, you know, that can take up to two years, you know, make sure that they're fully aware of what their rights are, what employee networks are available to them, what avenues they can go down and it, and it requires real effort to ensure that the onboarding process is successful and therefore the candidate will last longer within your organisation. And then at the end of it all as well, any feedback from successful from candidates, make sure it's clear, concise, and it allows your candidate to make a decision of what to do next. So we make sure you always feedback from successful applicants and make sure that is again by different criteria. <laughs> Phew! Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we've thrown all of that yeah. at you, but actually, um, nice then for you maybe to have time to ask us some questions to talk about things in more detail. Yeah. Of course, we're conscious that it's a beautiful day and most of you will be desperate to rush off and do other things. Um, but really, that's a, a very brief overview of all the different points that we need to be considering when we, we are creating more job, inclusive job descriptions and, and carrying out more inclusive interviews as well. Um, of course, depending on each situation, that will change a little bit, but, but really it's a quite a comprehensive overview of the main yeah, points. Yeah, definitely. And, and just, just another note, obviously, we, we know that obviously um, there's going to be a lot of candidates coming out to the market at the moment. And what, what, what even though we, um, you know, diversity is, is very important, it's a very noble question, it, it, it's a benefit financially as well to most organisations yeah. to be inclusive as possible. There are groups and candidates in them, groups who kind of have huge value who currently are on the market who aren't don't have a route to the market and if you can bring them into your organisation you'll get top performance from different groups um, so it's really important to think about these things and really add value to your organisation. Definitely and one of the points you just mentioned there of course about um, all of these candidates on the market at the moment or in the market at the moment um, of course we're talking externally we haven't really touched on uh, very much how you might be able to, to look at candidates internally but again yeah. this is something that we really need to think about are there people within our organisations who are overlooking um, and, and can we include them in, in that process as well and then give them better opportunities. Yeah. Um, okay right Catherine I hope that's okay we've thrown everything in just under 45 minutes so I think we've managed to get through everything. Um, it might be a time just to see if there's any questions or things that people want to ask us. Um, okay, I can see there's a few things here on the right hand side. Can we have a copy of these slides? There is a recording of the video so you can watch the whole thing again, which um, Catherine will share with you. So that's really, really great. Um, the links, yeah, what we'll do is when Catherine sends out the um, data, I'll make sure to include in there the links to anything that's important. I'll just make a quick note of that. Um, do you just want to read through the questions for me? I want to write that down. Um, yeah, so it's about the links in the chat. Um, okay. The next one, um, you mentioned tokenism, but what are your thoughts on applying the Rooney Rule to mm -hmm. interviews? You mentioned tokenism, but oh, what are your thoughts? Point. So with regards to that, I've got, um, I, I think it's, you, legality, the legal element of it, you know, it, it's, it's quite difficult and it's quite a grey area, but I think the reality is if you want to have a more diverse organisation, then we need to see, you know, people from different groups and different groups have their bones on seats at senior level. 
I think we need to accept that there's going to be an element of tokenism out there. You know, and, and it's just something that it's uncomfortable and it's difficult. And because what we deal with is quite a noble quest in diversity, you know, and it doesn't feel right to interview not the best person for the role. Um, you know, I think we need to accept that's going to be an element of it. Um, that's my opinion. I don't know what your opinion is on this. No, I mean, we've talked about tokenism yeah. a lot because it's, it's a really difficult topic. And, yeah. and, you know, one of the other perspectives is that really, well, if that tokenism is going to open up that space to a new group of people or a more diverse group of people, is it a necessary evil almost? Yeah. You know, we're not doing the right thing, but actually we are doing the right thing and that then we're opening up that space to more people. Um, so it's, it's a really, really difficult one, I think. Yeah, I, um, I, I think it's, it's really what you feel comfortable with yeah. doing. Um, I mean, and it also goes into the equality versus equity yeah. role, you know, I mean, as, as long as you can, you know, don't hire, you know, a woman or a black person or an Asian person just because, just because, because there's a woman or a black person. You know, as long as you can provide, I guess, a, you, yeah. if you are going to go down that route, you know, you need to provide the structure with it, you know, because otherwise you're just going to lead to negative, um, negative uh, benefits. Again, another point about is the representation you know yeah. we you know if by having senior leaders who are from diverse groups it means that the people who are entering the organization with the you know the graduates the apprentices if they see representation on the top level that will by default inspire them to progress further mm -hmm. if they can see themselves in that role so it is and that's a really big benefit of it yeah and that's that's where i look at it from but, but it's difficult and again you know we say tokenism there are millions of extremely wonderfully qualified candidates who might be from a underrepresented group so it doesn't need to be tokenistic as yeah. such it's just that you are luckily by doing things more inclusively attracting those people to come to interview and you then yeah. have the opportunity to include them um so i think tokenism has this kind of negative connotation yeah. but Actually, it shouldn't be if you're doing things correctly. Yeah. No, it shouldn't. Yeah. You shouldn't need it if, yeah. you, if you're doing yeah. things correctly. Yeah, yeah. The, the old rule in American football I think that's but, um, um, it's interesting. Okay. Oh, is it going more? Right. So, would you recommend advertising in as many places as possible? I can see how this will be beneficial, but it might be challenging for small businesses who have limited time. Um, yeah, definitely in as many places as possible. There's lots of free. Th well, you're better at this, but there's loads of free stuff online. And one example I always include that that you love is um, quite a big organisation I worked with this time last year started advertising within chicken shops, fried chicken shops. So they got loads of really young candidates and, and created a, a more diverse workforce in that way. And actually it cost them no money. They sent someone out to stick up 20 posters in, in the fried chicken shops and the younger people saw it at different times of day and in different places, you know, people who wouldn't be looking on LinkedIn. Yeah. And, and it doesn't necessarily need to cost you anything, but what's Yeah, really yeah, I mean, obviously working, um, you know, with, with the Ocal element, yeah. you know, and, and seeing how we have to go out and source diverse candidates for our clients. It's about being creative with your advertising. You need to adapt different strategies. And I think I wouldn't go with a blanket approach. What I would do is understand what the diversity of your workforce is and target where you need help. And then if you just target the areas that you need help and try and promote that rather than just going for a blanket approach, what you can do is actually provide a better um, you know, you get more diverse candidates and it's a better return than Lincoln because then diverse candidates, you know, will increase your productivity yeah. and all that sort of stuff. But actually the cost of advertising through then diverse avenues is actually quite cheaper because different communities and different groups are actually very eager to engage and get into the workforce, but they just don't know the means. So it could be something as simple as sponsoring an event and turning up for the day and um, delivering a couple of seminars and having conversations with young people or older people within that community and they will be able to they will be completely free um, for you guys to hold. It's just, it's just going to cost you time. So um, it's going to be difficult. But what I do is, if, if you if you're very, if you need to be quite strategic with how you advertise it, and especially around your money, I'd have a look at the diversity of your organisation and then go out and target where you need to, yeah. where you need to target rather than just going for the blanket approach. And that's where all this planning and really considering obviously is is, is very helpful. Yeah. People leave it to interview stage, but actually the majority of the work needs to be done before that. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so the next question we've got is generally it's said that an interviewee is generally decided within 30 seconds to be hired or not. How true is this? If you use our tools, not at all. <laughs> you know, if, 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 if you want, you, I mean, if, if, you take, if, if you take what we've said into consideration, I'm assuming you know, obviously you've dialed into this, so you do have a genuine interest in it. If you take that into consideration, yeah. then no, because what you're doing is you're creating a factual based argument for why that person should work within your organisation. Yeah. However, everyone has an internal bias. You yeah. know, and it, it's everyone's got it. It's not 
it's you know it's seen as a negative thing but as long as you can acknowledge it and know what it is you know you can act against it so, and, and working on that yeah having exactly. that internal bias is, is something we all have but that can't be your excuse for doing things we've all yeah. got to really apply the processes consistently we've got to think carefully about what we're doing but then this is why you have that evaluation stage you have the questions you're going to talk to different people and you're going to justify your decisions you can't say oh i like this person because they fit with the company yeah because then you're hiring people exactly the same as you and you're not valuing that candidate on their actual skills you're valuing them on how you might fit with them at a more social level um, and of course looking at that diversity and inclusion you know we need to be looking at um, diversity training we need to be looking at unconscious bias training and really learning what it is that's maybe um, making us jump to certain conclusions yeah. or, or feel an affinity with one group rather than another and that's something that needs to be challenged definitely I think it's diversity is actually really easy you know it, it yeah. is it's a it's a huge subject and it's quite difficult to comprehend. But if you if you break it down into small processes throughout, so for example, we've gone through the recruitment process and interview process. If you actually define it, there are small, 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 small changes, you know, rather than one big change. And if you look at it in that way, it's actually relatively easy to implement if you've got the will to do it. Yeah, and, and the, the inclusion part is maybe a little bit more difficult because that's yeah. where it takes some actual work at really yeah. looking at uh, what it is you're doing and making those changes. But again, if you do things slowly and you look at them systematically, it's it's actually quite simple to do, but it does take a bit of effort and time. Yeah, right. um, but it, if you're doing that correctly, then you shouldn't be making your decision in 30 seconds. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and the last question, why do interviewers go to the full extent of questioning even though they've made their minds up not to hire somebody, sorry, not to hire someone on some or the other ground. Again, I mean, it, going back to the similar question yeah, before, I mean, I, isn't it? I wouldn't bring someone in who um, who I didn't have a genuine belief that they could yeah. get a job. You know, and, and I think that's really, really important. You know, you need to bring people in who you genuinely believe can get the job and met the yeah. criteria for the role. Um, if you if you I don't think it's good practice to do that one. It's a waste of the interviews time and it's a waste of your time as well. Um, so I personally would argue that and say that that shouldn't be happening. Yeah. It, it sounds like bad practice. Um, don't know what that's exactly the same. Yeah. Really bad practice. Why would you be doing it? It's a waste of everyone's time. Um, if you are doing that, it's just really a tick box exercise. You're not actually looking seriously at what it is that you want and, and which candidate is going to be the best for you. Yeah. Um, Okay, <laughs> we were in agreement on that. Yeah. Um, so just to give us any more questions. Okay, last one just popped up. So what are your thoughts on SMEs asking people from outside of their company, helping the recruitment process to get more diversity in the panel? Sole traders, sole traders might be more susceptible to unconscious bias. Oh, okay, I'm going to say one quick thing about unconscious bias and then I think this is for you. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't like the assumption that sole traders will be more susceptible to unconscious bias. I think every person individually is susceptible to unconscious bias. I don't think you can apply that to one person who is in a big company or a small company or working independently. Um, unconscious bias is something that every single person needs to deal with. Um, we can't be saying sole traders will, will have this issue more than others. Um, of course, it will be more difficult for smaller teams or for sole traders to deal with these things simply because of time restrictions or maybe financial implications of, of getting in help to deal with that. Um, but I think it is something that we need to recognise as a problem for everyone across the board. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I look at that question slightly differently. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just see, um, I see it as if you're a solo practitioner. Yeah. You know, you're not going to have that diverse thought um, that that person to relay on and have that conversation with um, yeah, and create that course. diversity within the interview panel. So if, if that's where you prefer that, that, make, that makes sense, you know, yeah. and it's, you're right, you know, everyone does have an unconscious bias. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, definitely, especially when it comes to the, that there are actions that you can take when it comes to reviewing the, going out and sourcing the candidates, reviewing, reviewing the CVs and making yeah. the decision of who to bring in through interview based on what they've done. You can do that yourself and there's a lot of resources out there for that too. To help you do it. When it comes to actually interviewing the person, I think it's worthy of going out there and bringing external people in. It might be, you know, it might be a friend, it might be, a, well, ideally not a friend because they're going to see things yeah. similar to you. You know, it's someone like, it's from a different group of lads in a different yeah. way slightly. So bring someone in who's different to allow them to come in and, and, and be the second yeah. pair of eyes in the room. And, you know, the difficulty thing is when we, when we bring people in for interviews, we want them to think like this naturally because yeah it makes our lives easier but the reality is being challenged it drives innovation it drives productivity it allows you to do things in a different way so um I, I would definitely say if you can bring someone in bring someone in as 
uh, especially by, by the interview stage. Yeah, you need them second pair of eyes well. definitely. Whether or not they're, a, they're an industry expert or not, having somebody there to help you talk to the candidate and, and evaluate certain points of that would, would be really, really helpful. Yeah, definitely. Um, you, it's what Omar says, you need a second pair of eyes. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and, 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 you know, by the time you've brought them in front of the interview, you already have an understanding that technically they are able to fill the role. So that, that shouldn't, you shouldn't need that industry expert. It can be something that is completely unrelated to the industry. Okay, uh, just a couple of things that popped up as well. Some more questions. What would you recommend for a firm that outsources their recruitment? DI is a hot topic for us at the moment, but our RPO tends to push back as it was not in their terms when they signed with us. Is it our responsibility to be doing all of this? Sorry, is it their responsibility for doing this or ours? I would say it's yours. You know, at, at the end of the day, you know, if, if sourcing suppliers is the responsibility of the person sourcing those. The supplier, you, I, I would definitely push that back on you. Organisations, when when you sign them terms, you know they, they can come back and push back on it, but you just need to make it clear that obviously if you're going to continue with the contract or whatever it is, you need to they need to go out there and become more inclusive, and you want to see more diverse candidates coming through. So I would push back at your supplier definitely advise that they need to make that make make it clear that that's it that's important to you. Obviously, if it's something that you're looking to change, it's a negotiation because then it goes on to the formal business. But at that initial point, um, you know, make sure it's in the terms that you want in that diverse kind of the base and define how you want them to source that candidates. You know, if you know you want to see candidates from different ages, different locations, and make them do the work on the back of you, if you've outsourced it to them, you know, you can assume you pay them decent, decent money for it. You know make them do the work because you're not doing the actions yourself, but the responsibility is on you because they're only, you're the one who's paying for the bills at the end of the day, so they're going to act on your instructions. Yeah, and, and of course it is in their, their interest to do that as well now, you know, I think people are becoming more aware of this yeah, as well. Um, and then there's another question which I think is really interesting, this last one. I've had experience of people learning the right things to say based on the job description and the surprise questions actually weed out who's best for the role. Are you completely against surprise questions relevant to the role but not spelled out in the job description? So I know what I'd say. I'm, I'm going to assume mm -hmm. that's based on technical competency okay. you know, rather than um, the soft skills and when it comes to technical competency if there are questions that you want to throw out there to challenge them what's on their cv i i think that's fine because they're factual based questions you know if you had someone one plus one they can only the answer of three um you can already read them out and you can make sure that they, they've they've said something on their cv which is against what you need as a, as a basic so I would say on a technical element, that's fine. Yeah, I was kind of looking at it in, in terms of more of a soft skills approach. Um, my comment would be, particularly, for example, neurodiverse candidates don't deal very well with surprises um, and, and those social skills that other people might find a little bit more comfortable. Again, we're generalising, but just to save time. Um, they wouldn't deal with that as well and actually very often of course we are judging people on how well or how easy it might be to work with them and if somebody struggles to deal with answering a question that hasn't been prepared we might kind of automatically mark them down a little bit and again you're putting them in a in a unfair position because in terms of them doing the role they might be excellent um but they, they don't deal with with that unprepared or unplanned um questioning in, in the same way as other people might do and it's just being aware of that and, and if you do that maybe taking that into consideration as well when you're when you're judging things or assessing things not jumping to any conclusions yeah yeah, um, yeah. do we have any more questions uh, i think that's the last one we've had nothing else to pop up. we've scared everyone off okay we've tired them yeah. um if there are any last questions of course just pop those in the chat box we're we'll very happy to to talk about anything that, that you wanted to ask remember of course as well Please feel free to connect with us, get in touch with us. You have our emails there and our names. Send us a message, connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, we will be sending out a Calendly invite though, yeah. um, with what well, we will be sending it. Um, probably just will be sending it. Um, yeah. And then that's going to have an access to a free, free consultation, yeah. um, completely free, just to talk through what, what your challenges are. We'll just have an open discussion with yourself. Yeah. Click on that if you want to, and, or as Kelly said, you know, just link with any of us on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, and that's really the best way to contact us or through the email. Yeah, I've made a quick note as well that somebody asked for the links to the, the text that we put up as well. So I'll include those links in that email that Catherine sends out to you. So it's a little bit easier. You have to watch the yeah. whole video again. Thank you very much. Um, Catherine, I don't think there's anything that we need to be doing. 
No, all good on this end. Thank you very much, guys. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having us. Yeah, thank no? you. Um, and we'll speak to you all very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.